This presentation documents a small part of a much wider visual research investigation that was started midway through 2018 and is currently ongoing. Uh, this recorded and archived iteration is of an original presentation uh, and it consists of static imagery with an accompanying discussion. So it's pretty much static images with me talking over the top, which is slightly different to the original presentation where there was some input from uh, attendees. Uh, this is where the presentation begins. Uh, the aim of this project was to investigate the increasing use of high vis or fluorescent uh, color, um, but also the fluorescent materials and, in particular, the garments that the, this, these colors are applied to, um, uh, and what their cultural significance has sort of evolved into. What this presentation then aims to do is to follow a loose path through this amassing of visual research. Uh, utilising mythologies inspired by Batia Sutta, uh, and I'll include a link to her work in the description below. Um, wherever I reference a link, I'll try and include it in the description below. Uh, what I've done is I've uh, taken 10 images from this um, collection of, um, of visual research, uh, and I will discuss uh, these 10 images in terms of relevance and the sort of connections that I'm currently imposing on them, um, which uh, I hope to sort of find new connections from. Uh, just a note, for this iteration, a subset of supporting images has also been added in that were absent from the original presentation. Uh, this is by no means the first image I found, but it is a helpful starting point for this presentation, I think, um, because it talks about PPE, uh, which stands for Personal Protective Equipment, uh, which is a standard that is uh, for uniforms, on particularly on construction sites, but also other sites um, and workplaces. Uh, and this standard has spread from country to country, forming a patchwork of legislation that adapts to pre-existing condition, conditions wherever it is installed. In Australia, and I think also in the UK, PPP is off the materials, um, the high, vis uh, high visual materials are referred to as high vis. This second image is one I haven't found yet, but I'm convinced is out there somewhere. I just need to, I just really want to find it. Um, but uh, I noticed in Australia in particular, um, PPE and high-vis um, garments and materials are very widespread and readily available. You can go to your local, you know, hardware warehouse and there'll be a whole sort of rack of them, which means people have been... Um, using them in domestic situations, particularly older Australians who might have retired or, or um, feel like they want to still be part of the workforce. You'll see sort of older Australian men like with their leaf blowers like around their houses or out in the streets wearing their um, PPP, PPE high-vis um, garments. The image I want to find is of an older Australian woman, um, preferably at home in a domestic situation, doing some sort of tasks where she's decided she needs to wear this high-vis material, even though she's at home. Um, I'm convinced that happens, but I just haven't found uh, the images of it. I'm, I really want to find them. Um, this third image is of some construction union workers in Mel uh, in Australia. I'm not sure which capital city they're in. Um, and they're all wearing merchandise, which is available from the construction union's websites. Um, there's a different merchandise shop for each state that the union operates in. Um, and the churn of this merchandise is just phenomenal. Like, there's new versions of um, garments being produced, like, um, all the time. And not all of them are available through the website. Some of them are distributed um, between members. And they cover, they're produced to cover a wide range of events and topics and issues. So the construction union in, unions in Australia are... are um, directly linked to one of the major political parties, so they hold a lot of sway. Uh, and if they ever feel like 
the politicians aren't listening to them, then they will strike and protest. Um, and there's usually a range of merchandise to support that as well. Um, sometimes it's specific to the issue. Sometimes it's quite general. Um, this image is interesting because the guy in the... Um, they often have quite inflammatory sort of texts on these garments. The guy in the green high-vis, his top says, Stand up, speak out, fight back. Um, the One of the union leaders, John Sector, has been seen sporting a T-shirt that's from the union merchandise collection. It says, Battles Decide Everything. Um, and there's also sort of imagery, like you can see the guy in the far right's got this sort of snake curling around his shoulders. There's often sort of skulls and flames and daggers <laughs> and just sort of really aggressive, in-your-face sort of uh, imagery um, deployed on these tops. Um, like I said, the churn of this merchandise is so phenomenal because it's not just produced for... Um, uh, things, uh, uh, protests and issues. It's also produced for things like um, when the union wants to discuss diversity, or if they want, <laughs> if people want to celebrate a public holiday or St Patrick's Day or something like that, they will produce merchandise again. So it's just this really fast turnover and churn of all sorts of different merchandise, all relating to um, the the union and their um, uh, goals and ideas, I guess. Uh, this article came up during the what the sort of research phase, I guess. Uh, it was from this. It was an article from the Guardian about a place called Hinkley Point in the UK, which is where they're building a new uh, nuclear facility. It's a huge construction project, so it's getting a lot of attention because of the size of it. Um, but also, um, it's been pointed out that. Uh, it's also a site where the workers are sort of isolated in a way. Um, so it's not to get to like the local towns, you have to be bussed in and out, um, which means they've supplied sort of on-site facilities for people to sleep and to live. Um, but um, what this article was interested in was the fact that there's been a rise in suicides and depression on this site. And they make a direct connection with the idea of a sort of uh, toxic male-led uh, environment that is causing sort of mental health issues. Um, because essentially, you know, building sites have, are still have not really achieved equality in terms of gender. Um, they're still largely male um, and very macho sort of places. I'm going to quote from the article, and this is by, uh, a guy called Malcolm Davies, who is a civil convener for Unite, which is the UK one of the UK construction unions. So he goes into sites and he does sort of the groundwork and talks to people to try and resolve certain issues on behalf of the construction union over there. Uh, and he says in this article... Um, construction is a very macho industry. We have the highest amount of mental health issues of any sector. And there he's drawn a line straight from <laughs> sort of this masculine, hyper-masculine macho environment to mental health issues. It's just a straight line for him. Um, he goes on to say men are doing very physical work with manual handling of heavy objects every day. And if you're the big bloke and you say you can't cope or are seen crying, you will get ridiculed. Um, one of the other areas of investigation, this is one I picked up on when I visited a shopping mall um, that was sort of had been remodeled in the suburbs of... Um, Melbourne, but had been remodeled to become this sort of destination for luxury fashion and goods. Um, and amongst all these sort of very flash, shiny um, shops, there was this one shop called Bad, <laughs> and it was full of PPE and workwear that um, was, you know, made for buying to take to construction sites or to take to work, but also had this extra bit of branding that was uh, aiming to make them seem really cool and trendy, like you, you could wear these not just at work, but any time. Uh, hence the name Bad, <laughs> which, you know, they're setting themselves up for a fall with a name like that, I know. But, um, yeah, they used 
this little logo that said bad on all the garments <laughs> and all the signage. This image is from a fashion shoot uh, that the brand did, which they then posted on their Instagram account. Um, and if, uh, again, I'll include a link, but if you go there, you'll see the male models are very um, buff, sort of uh, unapproachable looking figures, often just sort of standing in isolation, sort of uh, looking really tough. Um, but when it comes to photographing the women, it's almost like um, it's, there's, it's, there's, the photographer's been unsure exactly how to, to place a woman within these sort of um, macho masculine sort of environments. So in this image, she's literally sort of stuck in this sort of metallic cage uh, and she's not even sort of able to grab the controls. She's sort of got her arms back like she's sort of stuck in there somehow uh, and just sort of surrounded by this almost apocalyptic looking construction environment. <laughs> and the guy in the background is just sort of roaming free, you know. Um, this is a bit of a more light, I guess, um, piece of research. So uh, Roisin Murphy is a music artist who had a pop career attached to a major label for a long time. Uh, after a break, she returned as an independent artist and took on not only the distribution of her own music, but also all the visual aspects, including the styling and video direction of um, campaigns around certain albums. Um, for an album she released three years ago, she, she used the nickname Hi Viz Liz uh, and took direct inspiration from uh, what she saw as like this huge amassing of construction sites within the city of London. So what she essentially did was for the styling, for the clothes, for the campaign and for the music videos, she ordered a lot of it from these sort of generic uniform websites. <laughs> And I love this still because this is of... Uh, I went and looked at some of the websites where she apparently bought some of these clothes. Uh, and this is the generic women workers outfit. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, a really cheap, nasty sort of suit. But instead of trousers, there's a skirt. <laughs> and she sort of parodies this, um, the weird sort of genderizing of uniforms uh, in this way. Um... I will uh, include a link to the full length video, but I'm just going to play a little snippet of it now because she does wear a lot of high vis and PPE, but in some interesting ways. Um, so this, I think we're halfway through, this image jumps back to possibly the second image which I couldn't find <laughs> because it uh, includes a lot of sort of middle-aged people who possibly have never worked on building sites before but donned these um, high-vis jackets in order to protest. So these are the Gilets Jaunes protests uh, that began in France. Um, and I find the really interesting thing about these is that they started off originally about certain issues around tax reform, but as this movement spread further and further, um, it became a container for all sorts of issues. Um, for instance, when the Yellow Vest protests reached London, it was the pro-Brexit um, protesters outside Parliament House that was wearing the Yellow Vest. Um, so it's this really interesting thing where it's highly visible, it makes an impact, but it's also anonymous in many ways. So it's really hard to um, create a meaning that can be attached to these other than the fact that they create a group 
um, and that they are really easily recognized. One of my fellow students mentioned that in France uh, there's a regulation where you have to have a yellow vest in your car. Um, or else you will get fined. So the other thing is too is these were readily available. You just had to like grab it out of your car, um, which then leads to this like uh, me looking, <laughs> led me to looking at uh, where you get these things online, um, and realizing that there's this m huge multiplicity. Like the the designer in me wants. Uh, to create some sort of order where they, the different coloured vests mean very particular things and PPP legislation would definitely um, help with that although it does change from country to country but then you go online and the multiplicity is just overwhelming there are so many options that and ways to customise um, PPP and high-vis garments that it's the combinations seem almost endless this was a strange detour I took, <laughs> um, and I feel like it links back to the, to the ideas around toxic masculinity, um, because suddenly we I found this hyper-feminized reading of rave culture that was very much reliant on the fluorescence and PPP style materials and colors, um, but it was definitely this sort of... Um, a lurid way of looking at uh, women through a very uh, hyper-feminized male gaze sort of perspective. Um, uh, and I began to think about the evolution of rave and rave culture. Um, one stream of uh, rave culture is that it creates an idea of freedom away from gender norms. It's a chance to lose your mind and cons constraints around expected identities can sort of melt away. But then you also have this stream uh, exemplified by these sort of outfits here um, that relies on dated but still very relevant discussions of the male gaze and a sort of homogenization. Uh, for, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I lost a lot of this imagery. Did I mention that? I did anyway. I lost a lot of it and then had to sort of rebuild my database a bit. Uh, and in doing so, I went off on a few different tangents. And this was a very recent uh, session where I really wanted to look at the materiality of this uh, high-vis PPE material, particularly where the colours come from, how they're produced, and how they make their ways onto garments. Um, so I began looking at early versions of iridescence or fluorescent materials, um, which took me way back to the Radium Girls. Um, which I felt like that was a very dark path <laughs> that I ended up on. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the Radium Girls, um, this is the name for a story about these uh, women that were working in a factory producing uh, uh, glow-in-the-dark clock faces at a time when this was a brand new sort of idea. Uh, and the material they were using to, that they were painting onto the faces uh, had a radioactive component that was actually quite um, high. Uh, but this was uh, that through the naivety of the company and through the naivety of the women. Like, no one realized that this was a highly toxic material. And there's stories of the women sort of painting their nails with it before they went out to sort of show off um, to their boyfriends and things like this. Um, and then later having a whole array of really terrible health issues. Um, what happened after that was <laughs> the material, obviously, you know, no one could work with it, but there were sort of very, sort of much more milder, um, but still radioactive materials were used within particularly watch faces. Um, and this uh, led me down a route of looking at all these sort of um, hype beast style sites where people were exchanging sort of really geeky in-depth knowledge about how to make things glow on watch faces. And it turns out that um, this material that's slightly radioactive is still used very much today. Um, this picture you can see there, encap it's encapsulated in these little glass uh, tubes. And this has led to the end. That was our 10th image. Uh, and what I want to do in this part of the presentation is just open up um, the question of what have I missed? Like, what connections have you seen 
that are valid in this discussion? Like, are there links between things that um, you really think should should be noted? Um, I have left the comments open below, but you can always just contact me if you want to share any other of your own personal research or any articles or anything like that that you think are relevant. And that is the end of our presentation. I just want to say a quick thank you to uh, my fellow students who sat through the presentation and contributed along the way. It was a really, um, really helpful and good sort of um, experience for me. So I thank you guys and that's the end of the presentation.